Hi, everyone, and welcome to our program on tax, transactional, and regulatory aspects of business transactions in the healthcare industry. Um, this is Saba Ashraf. I'm in the tax area, and I am joined by Larkin Elsie and Jennifer McFarland in our business and finance and healthcare areas. Um, just a couple of administrative points before diving in. Uh, we welcome your questions during and after the program, but we're limited as far as timing. Uh, so please feel free to submit the questions via the question and answer box or email them to us directly after the program or during the program. Our email addresses are, of course, on the on the cover slide. Um, if time allows at the end, we will certainly answer your questions during the webinar, and if not, we'll follow up with you after the program. Uh, we have circulated the slides in advance, so you should have them. We will also be sending the slides along with the recording of the webinar as a follow-up. With that said, let me begin. Um, and I'm beginning actually on slide 13, so let me scroll down to that. Hospitals and healthcare systems have been consolidating at a feverish pace in recent years. This is maybe due in large part because they're under uh, significant pressure to contain costs while simultaneously delivering higher quality care. Also, they'd like to access broader markets and provide more services. There have been some mega mergers, for example, the CHS Healthcare Management Associates Inc. merger, uh, which I believe closed earlier this year, valued at um, $7.6 billion. Um, but there have also been many non-mega unions taking place among hospitals and healthcare systems. Um, and further, hospital acquisitions of physician medical groups continue to take place at a regular pace. As hospitals, health systems, and others in the industry undertake business acquisitions and combinations, they can choose to structure deals in a variety of ways depending on their objectives. In large part, the structure is going to be driven by tax, regulatory, and other transactional considerations. Of course, a transaction can take the form of a traditional asset or stock purchase. Increasingly, healthcare organizations are adopting a joint venture model under which the two parties both hold interest in a new entity. Finally, parties can also pursue various alternative transaction models or virtual mergers that fall short of a full merger. We thought the best way to discuss the issues would be to go through four transaction models and, with respect to each of those, address the tax, regulatory, and other considerations. So the four models that we're going to go through are, one, a joint venture where the two parties form a joint venture entity to which they transfer their assets, two, a collaboration where there is no new entity formed, um, and then three and four are more traditional M&A structures. Scenario three is a stock sale, and scenario four is an asset sale. Uh, with that, let me begin with a discussion of the considerations in the first scenario, which is a joint venture. Uh, just a note, in discussing the tax considerations, I'm assuming specifically that there are two members, so the sort of structure assumed is the one shown on slide 15. <laughs> Excuse me. So there are two members. One is a for-profit entity, and the other is a nonprofit entity. They come together and they house the joint venture in a separate entity. So just by way of background, a joint venture is simply two or more parties coming together to jointly undertake an activity and share in the profits and losses derived from the activity. The reason economic downturn has caused a lot of tax-exempt healthcare organization and for-profit parties to examine ways to consolidate their operations and expand their reach, with one of the most common approaches being through a joint venture. They've been particularly useful models as hospitals try to capture more ancillary and outpatient services and as parties seek alliances. I'm on slide 15 now. So the first point to consider when you're approaching a joint venture is what should the joint venture entity be? And most parties do want to form an entity to ensure that the, that the parties have limited liability. So the entity, of course, you have many choices. It can be a, partner, a general partnership, a limited partnership, a limited liability company, or a corporation. Um, <laughs> if a corporation, 
is, is used as a vehicle for the joint venture entity, if it's a regular taxable corporation, then it'll have to pay income tax on all of its income. And the for-profit can't get its money out on a tax-efficient basis, and even the nonprofit partner may have difficulty getting any money out on a tax-efficient basis. So the corporation is probably not going to be the most attractive entity to use to house the joint venture. It's possible that the corporation itself could be a 501c3 organization, but again, that would limit how freely the funds can flow from the joint venture entity. Um, this is probably a common choice entity where both parties are tax exempt, but not otherwise. Uh, the joint venture vehicle could be a limited partnership. Uh, the pros are it offers limited liability to the limited partners, but you still need to have a general partner, and the general partner has unlimited liability. Of course, you can get around that by having the general partner be a single purpose entity. Um, but, you know, if you have the option of an LLC, which is by far the most common entity used to serve as a joint venture vehicle, most people tend to go with that. The LLC provides its members with limited liability, of course. Um, it allows them flow through tax treatment and no entity level tax, which is great. It has two basic advantages over partnerships, including limited partnerships. First, unlike a general partner who has unlimited liability with respect to the liabilities of the partnership, no member of the LLC has personal liability <laughs> for the debts and obligations of the LLC. And second, unlike a limited partner in a limited partnership, all members are permitted to materially participate in the management of the LLC without risking their limitation on liability. Um, on slide 20. Um, so flow through tax treatment is generally what the LLC allows for, and it's attractive for both the tax exempt and the taxable participants. In a flow through structure, the for profit's share of joint venture net income is subject to only one level of tax um, and only in the hands of the for profit participant. And if structured properly, the tax exempt partner is not taxable on its share of joint venture income so long as the joint venture's activities further its exempt purpose. So the two big things, the two main issues to watch out for in every joint venture that has uh, a member that's a tax exempt party are one, does it affect the tax exempt member's qualification for tax exemption? And two, um, does a tax exempt partner um, does it have income from the joint venture that's unrelated business taxable income or UBTI? Because generally, of course, tax exempt organizations don't pay tax on their income, but if the income is considered unrelated to their tax exempt purpose, then they do pay tax on it. There are two, uh, broadly, two different types of joint ventures that hospitals may enter into with for profits, and they are illustrated on slide 22. Um, the effect on the two issues we just, I just briefly mentioned, which were the UBIT issues and the tax exempt status, the analysis for the effect on those is different with respect to each of these um, structures, so I'll address them separately. But before addressing those two issues, let me touch on two issues that need to be carefully looked at in every single healthcare joint venture with a tax exempt. And those two issues are, um, one, private enormant, and two, private benefit, and they're somewhat related. So first, let me turn to private enormant, which is on slide 24. As a requirement of tax exemption, section 501c3 provides in part that no part of the net earnings of the organization can inure to the benefit of any private individual or shareholder. And private enormment occurs when an insider receives a benefit in excess of the fair market value of goods or services provided by the insider. The term insider isn't precisely defined, but it includes, it includes what you think it probably includes, which is members of the organization's board, its officers, their family members, affiliates owned by them, um, and likely others who have a substantial level of influence over the organization. So where the party to a joint venture is an insider, it becomes particularly important to ensure that any transactions with the co-venture are at arm's length. Um, as, as Larkin and Jennifer will discuss later on, um, there are non-tax regulations that focus on this also, but it's important for tax reasons also. 
The most obvious form of private enrollment is excessive salaries, but there are other examples, providing goods and services to members or other insiders without adequate consideration. Again, the consequence of violating the private enrollment requirement is that the entity would lose its tax-exempt status entirely. I am on slide 26 now. A corollary to the private enrollment doctrine is that uh, any transaction that results in private enrollment may also result in intermediate sanctions on the insider, on the party that received the undue benefit. The IRS can impose an excise tax on any individual entity or person who's a disqualified person with respect to the exempt organization and who receives a benefit from the organization that exceeds the fair market value of the goods or services. Um, the definition of disqualified person is very similar to the definition of an insider, and it's sort of an analogous concept. As far as the penalty imposed by Section 4958 on the insider, turning now to slide 27, the tax imposed is 25% of the excess amount. But then in addition to that, the IRS can also impose an additional penalty, an additional tax equal to 200% of the excess amount if the disqualified person fails to correct the transaction by repaying the excess amount to the tax exempt organization. And there are further penalties on the exempt organization's officer or director who knowingly approves any excess benefit transaction. Um, the tax regulations do recommend, and I highly recommend that this be done where there's a joint venture with insiders. Um, they provide for a procedure for creating a rebuttable presumption that the transaction is reasonable and therefore not an excess benefit transaction. Um, and the requirements are the arrangement must be approved by the independent members of the exempt organization's board or an authorized committee. The board or committee must rely on appropriate data as to the fair market value of the transactions, and the board or committee's actions must be documented concurrently in writing on a timely basis. So tax-exempt organizations generally do this as to, you know, all, all you know, it, in terms of um, any insiders or disqualified persons that are getting compensation. So similarly, that should be followed where the party to the joint venture is insiders or involved insiders. Uh, private benefit on slide 28, um, this is the second issue that's common to all healthcare uh, joint ventures involving a tax-exempt organization. Section 501c3 requires that an organization be organized and operated exclusively for charitable, religious, or educational purposes. Um, and an organization that's not organized for one or more of the purposes of uh, unless it serves a public interest rather than a private interest. So basically Section 501c3 organizations are prohibited from conferring benefits that are more than incidental on private parties. The two requirements, private enrollment and private benefit, are very similar. The difference is, though, the private enrollment applies only to insider, um, whereas private benefit applies more broadly. Also, as a private enrollment, no amount is acceptable, whereas as a private benefit, incidental private benefit will not jeopardize the tax-exempt organization status. So practically, what effect does this have on the joint venture agreement or the LLC structure? Um, all joint ventures must be organized in a manner that ensures that they won't effectively subsidize the for-profit participant in the venture. So here are some recommendations. Each joint venture party must receive an interest in the joint venture that is proportionate to the value of the party's contributions. Payments to participants or their affiliates for goods or services to the joint venture must be at arm's length at fair market value. And the terms of the joint venture agreement must not put the tax exempt organization's assets at risk um, to the benefit of any for-profit participant. Further, to ensure that the party's intent, I'm sorry, interest in the joint venture fairly reflect the value of their contributions, it's pretty important that assets that either party is contributing to the joint venture be properly valued. Um, so it is recommended that there be a third party independent valuation by a qualified appraiser. 
one point to note, as part of the valuation analysis, As part of the valuation analysis, the exempt organization must be credited with the value of any existing business that is effectively contributed to the joint venture. For example, consider an exempt hospital that transfers its existing licensed rehabilitation beds to a joint venture and agrees to discontinue the provision of those services once the joint venture facility is operational. The hospital should be credited in that case not only with the value of the physical assets contributed to the joint venture, but also with the revenue stream from the rehabilitation services that are diverted from the hospital and will be conducted by the joint venture facility. The same analysis applies when the exempt organization discontinues a service in favor of the joint venture. Failure to credit the exempt organization with the value of, of such existing assets effectively permits the transfer of ownership of the exempt organization's existing assets or business to a for-profit venture for no consideration. Similarly, the exempt organization should be compensated or credited with the value of any covenants not to compete with the joint venture. Um, so other recommendations, distribution schemes should reflect uh, arm's length terms. All unwinding of the joint venture should be done in such a manner that each member gets assets and other payments in proportion to their interest and in capital accounts. Other aspects of the LLC agreement should reflect arm's length terms. For example, the requirement to contribute additional capital. Now let me move on. Those were the two points that, as I said, apply to um, all joint ventures involving healthcare organization. Now let me turn specifically to the two uh, structures that were diagrammed on slide, slide 22. First, let me turn to whole entity joint ventures. So in a whole hospital or whole entity joint venture, the tax-exempt hospital remains in existence um, uh, and although it no longer conducts hospital operations directly, it receives allocated income and distributions from its interest in the joint venture entity. So the charitable hospital um, will basically be, as diagrammed on slide 22, will basically be transferring all or a substantial portion of its assets to the joint venture. The key ruling on this point on whether, you know, a fact pattern like that will be one that affects the tax exempt status or raises UBIT concerns is Revenue Ruling 98-15. It contains two examples. One is of a good scenario where there's no issue of UBIT or effect on tax exempt status and the other is a bad one. In the good one, the hospital controls a joint venture and is able to ensure that the venture furthers its tax exempt purpose. And that's because the hospital basically has majority representation on the joint venture board. The government documents require the board to satisfy the community benefit standard without regard to maximizing profitability. And the community benefit standard basically requires that charitable hospitals provide sufficient health benefits to the community. And finally, the fact pattern there was, and the good scenario was that the joint venture management uh, was managed by an independent party. The bad facts given to us were that, and I am on slide 34 now, the bad facts were um, that the hospital, and this is where its tax exempt status was affected. Here, the hospital is not able to further its exempt purpose with participation in the joint venture because there was 50-50 representation on the joint venture board. There was no charitable override in the governing documents. In other words, there was no, um, there were no provisions saying that if there's a conflict between the charitable purpose and the for-profit purpose that the charitable will override. And the joint venture was managed by an affiliate of the for-profit participant. The challenge in structuring the whole entity joint ventures is that most situations don't fall so neatly into either the good or the bad side posited by the IRS. Facts are typically in the middle. And the next couple of slides discuss key elements that play a role in figuring out where you're somewhere in the middle arrangement lies. <laughs> so in an ideal joint venture governance structure, um, it would allow the exempt organization to appoint a majority of the joint venture's board members and require a majority of the tax exempt organization's board members for a quorum or supermajority voting for certain actions. 
though highly preferred that it exist, majority control of the joint venture governance by the exempt organization is not absolutely required. And if it's not there, the key is establishing that the profit motives do not subvert the exempt organization's charitable mission. Where formal voting, so this is the next slide that assumes that the tax exempt entity does not have majority control, but it also assumes that it's, it's, it has at least 50-50. So in that case, where formal voting control of the board is lacking, there must be another mechanism to ensure that the joint venture will operate to further the exempt organization's charitable purposes. Um, An informal control exists if the exempt organization, for example, retains certain powers over major actions and has unilateral initiation rights with respect to certain actions of the joint venture, mostly relating to the charitable purposes um, and activities of the LLC. Um, it can be demonstrated if there is a for-profit manager, but that for-profit manager is under the control and subject to the authority of a management committee that has a majority of the tax-exempt representative. And it can be demonstrated by reserving certain powers for the review and approval by the tax-exempt board of directors. So an exempt organization might consider reserving for itself unilateral, unilateral decision-making power over certain actions. And all these actions, I'm not going to go through all of them, they're listed on slide 37, sorry. Um, but they basically relate to ensuring, they're relevant to ensuring that the hospital is operated and furtherant of the tax exempt purpose. Now, one key point to note is that, uh, that even though the IRS has recognized, you know, that um, control can go as low as 50-50 and there still will not be effect on the tax-exempt organization's exempt status. In a whole, whole entity or whole hospital joint venture, the IRS has never ruled favorably where there was less than 50-50 control. I'm on slide 38 now. Um, Turning to the documentation, the LLC agreement in particular, a few recommendations here. The LLC agreement and other documents should include a clear statement of the purpose or philosophy that indicates that the joint venture will be operated in a manner that is consistent with the exempt organization's charitable purposes. That is sort of the most important point. The LLC agreement and other documents should also include express language to reflect that the for-profit partners recognizes and understands the fact that the operations of the joint venture will not be conducted in a manner solely to maximize profits. The key is that this has to supersede the general duty that partners in a partnership or members in an LLC have to maximize profits for the joint venture or of the joint venture. The LLC agreement should have a dispute resolution provision that would cause the joint venture to satisfy charitable purposes without regard to profitability if there is, in fact, a disagreement that arises between the board and the members over the joint venture's policies on certain actions. The joint venture documents should also, this is ideally, give the exempt organization the right to bring suit to enforce the provisions regarding the charitable activities under the laws of the state where the joint ventures are formed. So as you can see from that discussion, actual operations are just as important as the joint venture's formal, formal documentation. Simply stating in the joint venture documents that exempt purposes should prevail will not be sufficient to demonstrate that the joint venture arrangement furthers the exempt purposes. It's important that the exempt participant be able to exercise control over key aspects and that the actions are consistent with the exempt purpose. So that was the whole entity joint venture. Um, and the other type of joint venture is the ancillary joint venture, which is also diagrammed on slide um, 22. So this is a joint venture uh, with a for-profit partner where only an insubstantial part of the exempt care health organization's overall ex assets and activities are transferred. 
to the joint venture. It's typically formed to operate a particular service, such as diagnostic imaging services, ambulatory surgical centers, or durable medical equipment. This sort of joint venture is much more commonly found than the whole entity joint venture. As with the previous whole entity joint venture, again, the two main issues that really have to be thought about are one, whether the income from the LLC is unrelated business taxable income, and two, do the income or activities of the LLC affect the participant's tax status? So here, here's a key distinction between ancillary joint ventures and whole entity. So long as the assets and activities of the joint venture are insubstantial, in other words, so long as the assets of the tax exempt contributed to the LLC are insubstantial, then the tax exempt partner may enter into an ancillary joint venture without jeopardizing its tax exempt status. Whether an activity is substantial is, you know, there's no bright line rule, all determined on facts and circumstances, including the time devoted by the exempt partner to carry on the joint venture activities. But in a 2006 PLR, um, the IRS did rule that where a 501c3 organization sold half its interest in its, you know, basically operations to a for-profit publisher, the IRS found that the activities under the arrangement constituted a substantial part of the activities, so it couldn't qualify for the guidelines for the ancillary joint venture. The key uh, sort of governing law is Revenue Ruling 2004-51. And briefly, the facts of that ruling were that a tax-exempt university entered into a JV structured as an LLC with a for-profit company to offer teaching, uh, teaching, teacher training seminars at various uh, locations using interactive video technology. And each of them owned 50% of the LLC, and their contributions were proportionate to, you know, there were 50% also. Um, under the LLC governing documents, all distributions, allocations, returns of capital were proportionate to ownership interest, so 50-50. Um, there was a six-person board that managed the LLC, and three persons were chosen by each side. Under the governing documents, the university had the exclusive right to approve the curriculum, training materials, and instructors, and to determine the standards for successful completion of the seminars. Those are all the activities related to um, the tax-exempt activities that the nonprofit actually carried on itself. And the for-profit was responsible for arranging and uh, conducting all of the seminars, including advertising, enrolling participants, and various other sort of activities. The IRS ruled that the university's contribution to an operation of an insubstantial part of its activities through the LLC did not jeopardize the university's tax exempt status. Since the activities were insubstantial in proportion to the university's overall standard exempt status, it didn't matter whether or not they, they furthered the tax exempt purposes. So moving on, so now that you're safe, that your tax exempt status is sort of safe, you move on to the next issue, which is to consider whether the tax exempt income from the LLC is going to be subject to unrelated uh, UBIT, unrelated business income tax. The IRS concluded that the university's activities were not an unrelated uh, trade or business. And the reason is that the exempt organization controlled those aspects of the joint venture's activities um, that were central to fulfilling the university's educational mission. Um, and this is despite the fact that there was a 50-50 structure and the exempt organization did not have formal majority control. So the takeaway is that in the healthcare context, the exempt participant should ensure control of those aspects of the joint venture that are relevant to the satisfaction of the community benefit standard. Um, and the community benefit standard, as I said earlier, requires that in order to be exempt, hospitals have to sufficiently benefit the health of the community. And that, in the case of ancillary joint ventures, is not so much because it's related to the tax exempt status of the nonprofit member, but it's more to ensure that the income flowing through the tax exempt member is not subject to UBIT. I'm on slide 47 now. Um, 
if an activity of the joint venture is considered unrelated, um, then if it's substantial, then of course it's taxable, so that's, that's one thing. But also, if it's substantial in relation to the exempt organization's charitable activities, then it can cause the tax exempt organization to lose its tax exempt status. And again, there's no bright line quantitative test for determining when it would be considered substantial. But uh, the chief, IRS Chief Counsel's Office has suggested that where more than 50% of the exempt organization's income is unrelated business income, the IRS will deny or revoke the uh, tax exempt uh, organization's tax exempt status. Um, now I will turn it over to Jennifer to talk about some of the regulatory aspects. Okay, so I will pick up there. Uh, just for starters, health, the healthcare industry in general is very highly regulated and is subject to a large number of statutes, regulations, rules, both at the federal level, state level, as well as local levels. So there are a lot of regulations that need to be considered any time you're participating in a business transaction within the healthcare industry. Our focus today is going to be on regulations and laws that frequently arise in that context. And some of the regulations will impact specifically how you structure the transaction. Others will arise during due diligence where you're investigating whether the other business or individuals that you're entering in into a transaction with have actually complied with existing laws and regulations and what potential liabilities you may be exposed to. So one of the first statutes that comes into play very often in the healthcare space is the Stark Law, which is also known as the Physician Self-Referral Law. Under Stark, a physician is prohibited from making referrals for certain designated health services that are payable by Medicare to an entity with which he or she or an immediate family member has a direct or indirect financial relationship unless an exception applies. Also, Stark prohibits the entity with whom the physician has a referral relationship from presenting or causing to be presented claims to Medicare or billing another individual entity or third party payer for those referred services. So key terms within that provision are designated health services and financial relationship, and I'll discuss those in a little more detail in a moment. If the conduct falls within the ambit of Stark, an exception must apply, that is the key. If an exception does not apply, then the conduct or transaction is prohibited. The penalties for violating Stark include fines as well as possible exclusion from participation in federal health care programs. Stark is a strict liability statute, and that's important to remember, so there is no intent requirement, which means you can't use ignorance as an excuse for not complying with a Stark exception. So back to that term that I mentioned beforehand, designated health services, otherwise referred to as DHS. It covers 12 different items here that are listed on the slide, which include clinical laboratory services, physical therapy services, occupational therapy services, outpatient speech language pathology services, radiology and certain other imaging services, radiation therapy, durable medical equipment, parenteral and enteral nutrients, equipment and supplies, prosthetics, orthotics, prosthetic devices and supplies, home health services, outpatient prescription drugs, as well as inpatient and outpatient hospital services. So our focus today is really going to be on that piece that involves the inpatient and outpatient hospital services and how that comes into play in these various types of transactions. And just to remember, Stark is triggered when a physician refers a patient to a hospital for those inpatient or outpatient hospital services. Examples of other relationships where this comes up is a physician um, who may own a durable medical equipment company to whom he refers patients for DME items such as walkers, wheelchairs, oxygen tanks, et cetera. So there's any number of types of relationships like that where you need to be aware of what um, Stark exceptions may apply and how to make sure you fulfill one of those exceptions. In some cases, you may meet any number of exceptions, but you have to meet at least one, otherwise you will be in violation of Stark.
The next term, financial relationship, there are two different types of financial relationships under Stark. The first is a direct or indirect ownership or investment interest in any entity that furnishes one of those DHS items or services that we mentioned, or a direct or indirect compensation arrangement with an entity that furnishes DHS. When you have a financial relationship under Stark, it must fit within one of those exceptions or the physician may not refer patients to the facility with whom he or she has a relationship and the entity may not bill for those referred services. There are three broad categories of exceptions. One is um, just a category of general exceptions that are related to both ownership or investment interest and compensation. Some examples of those include the physician services exception, in-office ancillary services exception, as well as others. Um, the other category are exceptions related to ownership or investment interest, such as publicly traded securities, as well as exceptions for mutual funds and specific providers. The third category are exceptions related to compensation interests, such as rental of office space, bona fide employment relationships, and personal service arrangements. The next statute we're going to look at is the anti-kickback statute. This is a criminal law. And under anti-kickback, there is an intent requirement, which is very different than Stark. So under anti-kickback, you have to knowingly and willfully commit this offense in order for it to be triggered. And anti-kickback prohibits the offer, solicitation, payment, or receipt of any remuneration, including any kickback, bribe, or rebate directly or indirectly, overtly or covertly, in cash or in kind, in return for, or to induce one of the two following items, the first being the referral of a patient for any item or service for which payment may be made under Medicare or Medicaid, or two, the purchase, lease, or order of any good facility, service, or item for which payment may be made under Medicare or Medicaid. Under anti-kickback, there are a number of penalties. As I mentioned before, it is a criminal law, so you may be subject to criminal penalties if you violate it, as well as administrative sanctions. And these may include fines, jail terms, as well as exclusion from participation in federal health care programs. One good thing about the anti-kickback statute are, is that there are safe harbors that are available. Unlike Stark, where an exception is required, otherwise you violate the statute, under anti-kickback, the safe harbors are optional. So you don't have to necessarily comply with one of these. However, if you do comply with one of them, then you are protected under law from criminal prosecution, but you have to make sure you comply with every element of the safe harbor. The safe harbor requirements are sometimes comparable to the Stark exceptions. In other cases, no safe harbor may be available under anti-kickback, whereas an exception would apply under Stark. In some industries rewarding those with whom you refer business to is very acceptable. However, in the healthcare space, it is a crime. So it's important to remember that and you've got to make sure that you're complying with these various statutes that come into play. Also, both under Stark and anti-kickback, you can request advisory opinions. So if you're unsure if your proposed transaction would meet one of the exceptions or safe harbors, you can request some guidance from the government. Under Stark, you submit such requests to CMS under anti-kickback, you would submit a request for an advisory opinion to OIG. Okay, and other statutes and regulations that may frequently arise in the healthcare space when you're doing business transactions are HIPAA, as well as high tech and state privacy laws. The final rule for HIPAA was released in January of 2013, and I'm sure a lot of you are aware that that mandated changes to your business associate agreements as of September of 2013 in order to comply with that final rule. Uh, there's more and more pressure for stringent privacy protection, so HIPAA is becoming one of those statutes that's increasingly important, and a lot of individuals are concerned about protecting their medical records, especially with this transition to electronic health records. So there are some competing objectives. And as electronic health records become more available, they are going to be more prone to breaches in privacy as well as breaches in data security. So we must be vigilant to protect those medical records. And this is one of the areas that you would definitely need to look into from a due diligence perspective whenever you are starting to do business with another entity to make sure that they do have privacy policies in place as well as breach notification procedures, good security, um, compliance policies and procedures, et cetera. 
Other laws that may come into play are antitrust laws. This frequently arises when hospitals or other healthcare entities in the same geographic area or market space merge or enter into such arrangements as joint purchasing agreements. There are, however, some safety zones available under the antitrust laws, and you can actually submit, uh, can submit a re business review request to the Department of Justice for guidance if you are unsure whether or not your proposed transaction would, would fit within one of those safety zones. Some of the safety zones are for joint ventures as well as hospital mergers and joint purchasing agreements. And I actually represented a hospital previously who had to seek DOJ approval to enter into a joint purchasing agreement and it was approved, so that's a great process to use if you have any doubt about it. Other laws that we'll just touch on briefly, FDA regulations, especially within the medical device industry, EMTALA, which is the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, and under that specific statute, hospitals are required to treat patients who present themselves to an emergency department whether or not they are insured, and a, a result of this statute is that it has caused a rise in uninsured patients actually using the emergency department as their primary care physicians. And so there's a lot of pressure for hospitals to comply with the statute, even though the hospitals are having to basically suck up the cost associated with providing this care to uninsured patients with increasing healthcare cost. Other statutes include federal and state false claims acts, Medicare, Medicaid billing and reimbursement requirements, state licensing requirements, as well as some states having certificate of need requirements. Um, whenever you're considering whether or not to structure the deal as an asset purchase or a stock purchase, this is one of the considerations that would come into play because frequently state licensure is a very difficult process. It can be very time consuming and it can significantly delay a transaction from happening or even cause it not to happen. And so in that instance, it may be preferable to use a stock purchase deal instead of an asset purchase deal when you're structuring it. Uh, one example, I represented a hospital who owned a subsidiary that was an ambulance service company. And there were a whole host of licensure requirements in order for a new company um, to be able to purchase that entity or the assets from that entity. And so in lieu of them having to go through the state licensure process or through the county zoning requirements to get 911 service approval for each county they wanted the service, they decided to do a stock purchase deal, which actually was an LLC, so it was a membership interest purchase in lieu of doing an asset purchase. Other requirements um, may come into play whenever you're looking at doing a transaction in a state where the corporate practice of medicine doctrine is enforced. So you need to be aware of those, of those um, requirements and whether or not it will impact your particular transaction. And I will turn it over to Larkin at that point. <clears throat> Thanks, Jennifer. And um, so I'll quickly jump in here and, uh, and hit some general due diligence points with uh, regards to regulatory issues, you know, specifically the, the whole host of issues that Jennifer just ran through. Um, you know, in generally speaking, any acquisition or um, any type of arrangement with another business, you want to go in and, and kick the tires and, uh, and make sure that everything's under control, make sure you understand what you're buying or what you're entering into. And, uh, and as you can see from Jennifer's discussion and Saba's discussion, there's a number of issues that could be at hand. And, uh, and so typically, if we're looking at the whole entity joint venture that Saba went through, and uh, the example would be that uh, a for-profit hospital and a non-profit hospital are forming a, a new joint venture entity, and then the non-profit hospital will essentially transfer all of its operations to that joint venture entity. So the for-profit hospital wants to look in and see what's going on behind the scenes at the non-profit hospital. Do they have any type of stark any kickback issues? Is there anything that, that could come back to affect the, the joint venture entity uh, in the years coming. And, uh, you know, the, what they typically look at are the, they'll, re, they'll review the HIPAA policies. They'll review all of the compliance policies in place. So they'll, they'll look at the protocol, see if it's actually being followed. And then, they, and then they'll review one by one the, uh, the physician employment agreements. They'll, they'll look to make sure there's some type of valuation component in place. And the reason for that is, uh, as Jennifer will hit later in the discussion, has already alluded to, is there are a number of exceptions to the Stark Law, and nearly each one of them has to do with the volume or value of referrals or the, the, the fair market value being paid to the physicians. So if the physicians are providing 
X number of services and being paid Y dollars as a whole, you have to look in and make sure that that's a fair market value payment, and that otherwise the government could see that as being paid for the volume or value of referrals. Uh, and then also, generally speaking, the, they want to go through and make sure that each of the other components are met of the employment agreements. They want to make sure there's identifiable services in these agreements and that um, and that's actually being met. Um, they also look at other contractual relationships with potential referral sources or active referral sources, um, leases between a hospital and physician group. You want to make sure that the hospital isn't overpaying for a lease or leasing space to a physician group um, at an undermarket rate, which could in turn be assumed by the government to be a, a payment for referrals. Um, medical director agreements are, are typically a, a hot button item because you, these have to be in writing and there's certain um, requirements for these actual agreements. And, and, and that's an easy way to either have a document that's, that's expired and that is no longer active or have a document that was inadvertently never signed. It's just administrative smaller issues that, um, they, that when the acquiring entity or the, the for-profit hospital in this example is looking into and, and conducting its due diligence, they're going to have an issue with that, and, uh, and they want everything to be as clean as possible going forward. So what are the resolutions? Um, you, know, you could have a potential self-disclosure where you go through the stark self-disclosure protocol put out by the government and um, go through that process, see what the – disclose what's happened, what, what the issue is to the government, and the cover, government will come back with some type of fine or, or settlement or possibly no action. Um, for smaller issues, you can have a direct repayment to the Medicare um, subsidiary there, and, um, and, and, and that's typically an arrangement that's used where, you know, for the example you used above, where the, they didn't sign the medical director agreement. And it's just a small issue, or there's, there's some type of, of overpayment that, that has been um, that's turned up in the due diligence process, and so they just refund that money. Um, if there are issues that surface, then there's a number of ways of, of dealing with it, and ultimately it's a reduction in the price. And depending on the structure of the joint venture, if, for example, the for-profit entity is putting in X amount over the next 20 years, that X amount might be reduced by, by a certain percentage. Um, and and there, there's other options, the structure. There, there might be more payments guaranteed towards the end of the relationship as opposed to the beginning while the, while the hospital or the for-profit hospital is being careful in, in what might turn up because there is uncertainty out there. Um, as you probably can, you can tell from Jennifer's discussion that some of these concepts are, are a little bit vague and it's not, it, there's no way of, of definitively telling whether or not the government's going to take action or not. And, um, and so you have to wait and see what the, what the results of an over, overpayment might be. Um, and now we're going to go back to Jennifer for ambulatory surgery centers. We wanted here just to focus on a specific example within the joint venture context so you guys have an idea as to an exception or safe harbor that may apply. So in this instance, we're looking at the anti-kickback safe harbor for investment interest in ambulatory surgical centers. So we're assuming that the joint venture that's being created, perhaps between a hospital and a physician practice group, um, is in fact going to be an ambulatory surgical center. So there are four different kinds of ambulatory surgical centers or ASCs that are covered under the anti-kickback statute and for which safe harbors are available, surgeon-owned, single specialty, multi-specialty, and hospital physician. And we're going to focus on the hospital physician safe harbor. There are specific requirements for each one of those types of ASCs. And um, one thing to note here is that there's no equivalent exception under Stark, but ASC services are not considered DHS or designated health services, which we talked about earlier. So you don't have to worry about fitting it within some other exception under Stark. Other safe harbors may also apply to joint ventures whenever you're creating an ASC. Some of those may include joint ventures in underserved areas, which um, invokes a specific safe harbor under the anti-kickback statute. With respect to the ASC safe harbor for hospital physician-owned ASCs, 
here are the requirements, and there's several of them. I'll, I'll just run through them quickly. Um, you must be a certified ASC under Medicare. The operating and recovery room must be dedicated exclusively to the ASC. Patients referred to the ASC by an investor must be fully informed investors um, who have an investment interest in the ASC. The terms of the investment interest must not be related to previous or expected volume of referrals, services furnished, or the amount of business otherwise generated from the investor to the ASC. The ASC or any investor must not loan funds to or guarantee a loan from an investor if the investor uses any part of that loan to obtain the investment interest. The amount of payment to an investor in return for the investment must be directly proportional to the amount of the capital investment, including fair market value of any pre-operational services that were rendered of that investor. All ancillary services for federal or state health care program beneficiaries performed at the ASC must be directly and integrally related to primary procedures performed at the ASC, and none may be separately billed to a federal or state health care program. The ASC and any physician or surgeon or hospital investors must treat patients receiving medical benefits or assistance under any federal or state health care program in a non-discriminatory manner. In addition to meeting those requirements um, with respect to the hospital physician-owned ASC, there must also be at least one investor that is a hospital, and all of the remaining investors must be one of the following. And the first one um, is with respect to general surgeons or surgeons engaged in the same surgical specialty who are in a position to revert, refer patients directly to the ASC and perform surgery on such referred patients or physicians engaged in the same medical practice specialty who are in a position to refer patients directly to the ASC and perform procedures on such referred patients, or physicians who are in a position to refer patients directly to the ASC and perform procedures on such patients. Second item is group practices of such physicians. Third, surgical group practices. Fourth, and or investors who are not employed by the ASC or by any investor are not in a position to provide items or services to the ASC or any of its investors and are not in a position to make or influence referrals directly or indirectly to the ASC or any of its investors. Another requirement is with respect to space and equipment rental. The ASC cannot use any space, including operating and recovery room space or equipment located in or owned by any hospital investor unless that space or equipment is leased from the hospital in accordance with a lease that complies with one of the safe harbors under the anti-kickback statute. Another requirement is with respect to personal services. The ASC, ASC cannot use any services provided by a hospital investor unless such services are provided in accordance with the safe harbor for personal services. Also, a hospital may not include on its cost report any claim for payment from a federal or state health care program, any costs associated with the ASC, unless such costs are required to be included by a health program. And finally, a hospital cannot be in a position to make or influence referrals directly or indirectly to any investor or to the ASC. And this may be a tricky requirement to satisfy. Okay, at that point, I want to turn it back over to Saba. Okay, we're moving on to scenario two. And scenario two is our second transaction model, which is pretty similar to the first one, um, except it's a non-ownership collaboration, which is still like a pretty broad term that can, you know, cover many different types of situations. Um, I'm going to zip through this uh, so we have enough time left over for to discuss scenario three and scenario four. Um, but I'm just going to talk about two non-ownership collaboration situations. Uh, which are fairly common. One is the joint operating agreement, and these are just contracts between two organizations to provide for the transfer of control over the assets and activities of the organization to a, basically a central governing authority. Um, uh, the hallmark of a joint uh, JOA is basically that the participating hospitals or entities, they retain their separate identities, their boards of directors, and some autonomy. Um, even though considerable management and financial authority is being shifted to the governing body of the joint operating agreement. The key difference uh, 
between a traditional joint venture and this is that there's no ownership in the change of the assets and each party basically retains their assets. Um, so from a tax standpoint, I think the thing to notice is that, for one thing, you could have a formal corporate structure even for a joint operating agreement, but most people don't. Um, and if they don't, even though there's no entity in place, the thing to remember is that these agreements will be treated as a partnership for federal income tax purposes despite the lack of an entity. Um, so there's gonna be a deemed entity, I guess, I suppose, for um, a partnership, to deem partnership for federal income tax purposes. Um, and the deemed partnership is, of course, between the tax exempt member and whoever the other member is. So what this means is that the analysis is exactly the same as it was under scenario one. I see a lot of people, they enter into sort of you know, contractual agreements, joint operating agreements, whatever you want to call them, and they they seem to think that because there's no entity, the issues are much less complex. But in fact, they're they're in most in most circumstances they're pretty identical. Um, moving on to slide 58, another common uh, sort of non ownership collaboration is a contractual relationship. So this would be your lease contracts, your leases, your management contracts. The tax issue to watch out for here is whether the party that the tax exempt is contracting with is an agent of the exempt organization because the IRS's concern is that an exempt organization should not be conducting an unrelated trader business through the agent. So they'll focus on things like, um, you know, the sort of control that the tax exempt has over the agent. And if there's sufficient control, then the activities of the agent are attributed to the tax exempt entity. And that give rise, gives rise to the issues we discussed before, which are one, it can convert otherwise tax exempt income of the tax exempt entity into one that's subject to UBIT. Um, and second, if that UBIT is sufficiently high, it can affect the tax exempt entity's status. And also, if the agent's activities are, are those that are prohibited to be engaged in by tax exempt people or organizations, such as political campaign activities or legislative lobbying, then the status of the tax exempt member is at stake. And with that, I will turn it back to Jennifer. Okay, and we are on slide 61 at this point. So with respect to non-ownership collaboration agreements, there are several regulatory aspects to consider here. A frequent scenario is an affiliation agreement or perhaps a management agreement. Under an affiliation transaction, it's basically a contractual relationship between healthcare providers that will increase efficiencies. Uh, resulting in a minimal loss in control. And it is sometimes, and perhaps even frequently, a prelude to an acquisition. So when two hospitals want to come together and think about a possible merger, they may first enter into an affiliation transaction just to get to know each other better, to review all the different areas of compliance that may be of concern. They want to look at potential liabilities as well as get a better idea as to how the other entity is functioning and performing on a day-to-day -day basis. And so with that in mind, it's important to keep the regulatory requirements in mind because you still have to comply with a Stark exception. And you also may have to comply with an anti-kickback statute safe harbor. Typically a larger entity um, would agree to make certain services or professionals available to a smaller entity at cost, which would mean it needs to be at fair market value. Also, um, they may also provide smaller entities with access to resources that would otherwise be unavailable. This may include any number of things, such as physician services, billing services, supply chain management, et cetera. And to give you an idea, let's go on to the next slide. Um, there are uh, several stark exceptions and anti-kickback safe harbors that are frequently uh, used whenever these types of relationships come up. One being the personal services and management contract exception. There's also a comparable anti-kickback safe harbor for that one. And this will arise whenever you're offering medical director services, perhaps on-call services, or even medical education services. Another possible exception is the fair market value compensation exception under Stark, but there is no comparable anti-kickback anti safe harbor for that one. 
Another frequent one uh, involves equipment leases as well as space leases for office space. And a big one because of the cost involved is electronic health records. And I've seen some entities pay upwards of 60 plus million dollars for a new electronic health record system. And so when you're doing that, typically only the larger organizations can afford it, whether it's out of their pockets or they're financing it, it's, it's a huge cost to take on. And so a lot of smaller entities who are still trying to, you know, comply with meaningful use regulations as well as others who want to have the access to electronic health records but can't afford to get the systems in place, they're relying on the larger entities to provide those items and resources in order for them to be able to, you know, share medical records as well as meet various requirements uh, under both federal and state law. So with respect to the EHR one, I just wanted to touch on that briefly in a little more detail. The 8515 rule is a key point under that one, and that basically means that the physician to whom EHR items and services are being provided, so if the hospital wants to acquire this large system and wants to be able to provide access to a small physician practice, let's, let's say, or even to a, a small hospital or some other type of healthcare entity, um, they first have to make sure that the items and services or are um, determined based on a fair market value basis and then require that physician practice group, let's say, to pay at least 15% of the cost of those items and services up front prior to receiving the EHR items and services. And so you have to do a, a really full cost valuation to determine how much would be allocable to that particular physician practice group. And it can be very hard to calculate, especially if you're going to provide access to the EHR system to any number of groups um, or individual physicians and trying to figure out how to allocate a specific portion of a software system is very tricky. And so it's important to bring in evaluation consultants to assist you with that. And I've even seen some clients who want to err on the side of caution, they are requiring physician groups to pay more than 15% just to make sure in case there was an error in the calculation that they're covered within the Stark exception and they're making sure that the physicians are paying their fair share of the cost. Um, so the, if you meet that requirement, then there's lots of other requirements under that exception, such as making sure that the agreement's in writing, it's signed by the parties, that it covers all of the items and services that are to be provided by the donor to um, the particular physician practice group or some other entity. Also, uh, you have to make sure that the system and services are going to be provided predominantly to create, maintain, transmit, or receive electronic health records. It can't be performing predominantly other services such as billing. And so this is important to remember if you're looking at big systems that can provide any number of services, you got to make sure that the pred predominant function um, pertains to electronic health records and then the other services are ancillary to that. The software must be interoperable when it's provided. And to meet this requirement, it needs to be certified by one of the certifying bodies that is recognized by the Secretary of Health and Human Services, such as CCHIT. Uh, the donor cannot take any action to limit or restrict the use, compatibility, or interoperability with other electronic prescribing or EHR systems. The physician cannot make receipt of the items and services a condition of doing business with the donor. So in that instance, a physician can't say, well, I'm not going to refer patients to you unless you provide me with access to your EHR system. That's prohibited. Um, also, you can't consider the eligibility of the physician nor the amount of the items of services when taking into account any volume or value of referrals. However, you can consider such things as a physician's membership on your medical staff. So if you want to limit it to only physicians who are on your medical staff, that's certainly allowable within this exception. One big point to note is that originally all of the EHR systems, items and services had to be provided by December 31 of 2013 and people were on pins and needles waiting to see at the last minute whether or not the government was going to extend that deadline. Thankfully, they have extended it. It's now been extended to December 31 of 2021. So you've got an additional eight years to make those donations and to get everybody on board with your EHR system. Now I will turn it back over to Larkin.
<clears throat> Thanks, Jennifer. So now with scenarios three and four, we're going to take a look at your more traditional M&A context uh, with scenario three, a stock purchase, and then we'll go more in depth with scenario four in the uh, asset purchase context. And with both examples, what we're generally looking at, and, uh, and, and Saba may vary this example a little bit in her tax discussion, but the uh, is a hospital acquiring a physician group. I think one key piece to keep in mind is that there's all types of physician groups. There could be a, a one doctor, general practitioner, in a small town um, setting versus a 50 doctor cardiovascular surgery group in a, in a large metropolitan area. And of course, they're going to have different revenue streams. They're going to have different ownership of various items, equipment, et cetera. And, um, and, I, and, and we'll, we'll allude to that as we go through the, uh, the discussion, but that is just one piece to keep in mind that, that maybe some of the, the um, concepts that we're talking about wouldn't be applicable to one extreme or the other. Um, starting out with the stock purchases, as you can see from the diagram, generally the uh, the stock or you know, in an LLC context, the membership interest will be transferred to the acquirer in exchange for cash, and um, ultimately those shareholders of the target will get will get um, cash as, as far as a, a payout. The um, there, there's no change of entity; the target stays the same. There's no transfer of assets. The uh, now we'll look at some of the benefits of a stock purchase. Like I said earlier, is what we're when we're really going to get into the, um, the the strategies for acquiring a physician group um, will probably be later in the in the asset purchase context. But in, in the reason for that being that that's the more traditional uh, structure to get to the uh, end goal. Uh, the benefits there are benefits of a stock purchase though, and um, and generally speaking, it's the lack of interruption in various relationships with with the third party payers with with Medicare or private payers with the providers in licensing or permitting um, scenarios, and also with general administrative burdens. Um, the, uh, it, with payers or providers, or, or really any type of contractor, any type of contractual arrangement that the physician group has entered into, the, in an asset deal, those contracts would have to be transferred, and typically there would be a consent requirement in those contracts. Um, with a stock purchase, you can, Usually bypass those consent requirements and uh, and 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 have no change whatsoever. So the regardless of the ownership structure, it's still the same entity providing the same services, and there's no interruption. There's no interruption in the billing. There's no interruption in the payments. There's no new address or new tax ID number where they um, where payments go to. And uh, and you know one consideration there is that. Sometimes, no matter what the contracting party can be, whether it can be a, a, some type of service provider that's outside of the uh, the, the medical arena, and uh, they could try to get an, an advantageous deal based on consenting to the assignment. Um, so that's one consideration to take in to take into account there, and um, and then with licensing and permitting. Now, some applications, such as the 855 applications, do require updates based on ownership, but generally speaking, the, a permit for an, an MRI or piece of equipment will, will stay intact. There won't be, have to be massive changes in that, in that area, and, um, and also you're probably staying in the same location, which you can do in an asset deal as well, but in this context, the, um, the lease would stay intact. There'd be no changes there, and again, no opportunity for the, the lessor to try and take advantage and, and bump up the rent in this, in this scenario. Um, it, it could also be used as a mechanism to get around something to get around some type of restriction that is imposed on the physician group that otherwise you could not get around in the, um, in the context of an asset deal. And, uh, and it could be a restriction, oftentimes you'll see it, a restriction that, that is imposed upon the physician group by a competing hospital of the acquirer. So they have a, a, a lease on the campus of a competing hospital and you want to try and, and get around that. The, the, you, you're, uh, the competing hospital is clearly not going to let its competition come in and, and lease its space and, and operate you know, on its campus, but the lease might be able, might allow a, um, a stock purchase where it's just different ownership as opposed to a different entity. 
Uh, the concerns of a stock purchase are clearly, just as in any business context, it's the lingering liability. And uh, in the healthcare industry, as Jennifer has um, gone through, there's, there's significant concerns. There's, there's the concern of overpayments coming back a, a year after, or six months after the, the deal is done that nobody knew was coming. And then all of a sudden, money that the, the acquirer did not earn, never had any part in, they're having to pay back and be on the hook for that. There's also the various fraud and abuse laws. If a Stark Law issue comes up down the road that the, the previous hospital had nothing to do with in advance, they're still on the hook. And, uh, and, and as Jennifer alluded to, and as, as we all know, the, those penalties are, are harsh. Um, also contractual disputes where a, um, where a third party comes in and sues that entity based on something that happened in the past and, um, and then all of a sudden the, the acquirer is, is on the hook for it. Now when we get into the asset context, we'll explain some general protections um, that, you, that you put in place in the definitive purchase agreement, and those will also apply to stock purchases. So there is some mechanisms of um, reducing your, your level of risk, but the, uh, the, it, it's not foolproof and, it, and it's much more certain in an asset deal. Um, and what, one last point here is that it, another concern of, of the stock purchases is that w maybe the benefits aren't necessarily something that the acquirer wants. The, uh, it, there, there could be a number of contracts of the physician group that's being acquired that the acquiring entity doesn't want. The, uh, they want nothing to do with. And in, 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 in that case, where if, under a stock purchase context, you have to deal with those, those contracts or, or try to get out of them in some way. Whether, whether it's you want a different contracting party or whether you want different rates, whatever it may be, it might be, there might be contracts that you don't want. And, um, and so that's, that's sort of the, the, the general overview of the concerns and benefits with a stock purchase. And now we'll move into the asset purchase. And just to introduce it, it's, it's, it's pretty basic. You, the, all the assets are transferred of the physician group. So if the physician group is an LLC, all of that LLC's assets, all of their equipment, everything they own, all of their contracts are transferred to what is typically a newly formed entity, which is the subsidiary of the hospital. And, uh, and I will let Saba take it for there for the tax discussion. Okay, thanks. Um, and just as Larkin said, the facts, uh, the scenarios three and scenario four, the facts are that a uh, physician practice group is being purchased. Um, for my purposes, I'm going to assume that the purchasing entity itself is a taxable entity since uh, tax exempt organizations probably don't care as much about the benefits they derive, you know, from the transaction structure as taxable entities do. So in focusing on the tax aspects of uh, traditional M&A transactions, um, one important thing to do, I like to step back and consider the broad basic goals of the parties. It sounds simple, but I think it's important to focus on those. So if you're the seller, if you're getting something of value, the first question you ask yourself is, or you should ask yourself, is why is this not income for tax purposes? Um, if you're entering into some sort of tax-free transaction, there's a chance it might not be income. If the consideration you're getting is not cash, um, there might be room to consider whether it's tax-free. But if you can't exclude the income, then the thing to ask yourself is how can I make sure it's taxed at a lower rate instead of the higher rate? Um, can I defer the income? Um, and uh, if I have to include it, can I at least defer it to a later time? Um, and if I can't defer it, is there any way to minimize the tax, to at least not have to pay more tax than I need to? And I'm on slide uh, 67 at this point. If you're the buyer, then the thing you're focusing on, you're not worried about having taxable income, but what you want to be sure of is that the money you're spending to buy your investment is invested in such a way so as to give you tax deductions so that later on you can use those tax deductions to reduce your overall income. Um, so with those goals being set, let me also touch briefly on the current rates because these rates are a bit higher than they were um, uh, just just less than two years ago. Ordinary income of individuals is right now at 39.6%. Capital gains, long-term capital gain is 
Um, so those are the two key rates right there. Now, the, it's 20%. You'll see that the chart on slide um, 69 says 23.8%, and that is because effective 2013, there's a new 3.8% net investment income tax, which only applies to investment income, which is, you know, dividends, interest, rents, royalties, annuities, and capital gain, which, you know, the sale of the stock of a corporation generates capital gain generally. So that now is subject to this new 3.8% tax, which everybody has to take into account. Um, the one way to get out of the tax is if the business that you derive your investment income of from, you materially participate in that. Um, which, you know, if you're selling stock, you're not materially participating in the business of selling stock, so it's going to apply to you here. Corporations generally pay 35%. Um, so slide 71 now. The stock sale is, of course, ideal for it achieves all the goals of the seller because it minimizes the seller's tax. The seller gets long-term capital gains, assuming the seller has held the stock for investment, which it would unless it was a trader or dealer or something. So in this example, the sales price is $100, assuming shareholder has no basis, that means taxable gains 100. The federal tax rate, and I'm not, I'm ignoring state tax rates for purposes of all these examples. So the seller pays total tax of 23.8, so the seller has left over 76.2%. So that's a pretty good tax result for the shareholder when you compare it to the other uh, scenario four. For the buyer, unfortunately, the buyer gets a $100 basis in the stock of a corporation, which is fine. But what the buyer cannot do, the buyer cannot depreciate stock. Stock is not a depreciable asset. So that $100 basis just sort of sticks around, and you can't, the buyer can't do much with it. Contrast that with uh, an asset sale. Here, the purchaser is the one that benefits because here, the assets are being purchased. Most of the assets and physician practices are going to be intangibles, goodwill, customer lists, customer relationships, and all those assets are, you can get tax deductions with respect to the purchase price you pay for those over, you get a write-off period of generally 15 years. So the $100 that the purchaser gave um, generates uh, tax deductions equal to $35 total. They're spread out over 15 years and 35% is the rate, that's how I'm coming up with the $35. So if you present value that using an 8% discount rate, the present value of the tax benefit to the purchaser is roughly $20. So the purchaser is happy. The shareholder doesn't do as well with the stock sale because first the target pays tax on all the gain on the assets. So the target pays tax of $35, targets a corporation. Then the target turns in, distributes the money to the shareholder, and the shareholder pays tax again. So as compared with net proceeds left over of 76.2 on a, on a sale of shares, there's only $49.53 left over here. Now this comes up a lot in physician practice sales, so I'm gonna mention it here. If you are stuck with this situation where you want to buy the assets, Target uh, is a corporation, um, and there's this, you know, huge tax to the seller, um, one sort of way of breaking the deadlock is doing an asset sale where you sell, the corporation sells the assets, and the shareholder, uh, the position's taken that all the goodwill, all the intangibles, that's mostly owned by the shareholder and not by the target corporation. And that way it's not being sold by the target corporation, it's being sold by the shareholder. Therefore, just one level of tax on that. So as you see in the example on slide 73, the sale of goodwill generates, we're assuming $90 is allocated to that, only $19 of tax, so, so you know, you get $71 left over from that. The rest of the consideration is paid to the corporation, but largely, you know, the shareholders left over with $75.95, which is not, not a bad deal. Um, it sounds great, but it only applies when the shareholder can say that the goodwill really is the shareholders as opposed to the corporations. Personal goodwill exists when the shareholder's reputation, expertise, or contracts contribute significantly to the company's value and future income stream. 
generally where the shareholder has entered into a non-compete with the target corporation or an employment agreement, um, the tax court has found no um, uh, that that there's no personal goodwill. So I won't go through them because I want to oops because I want to make sure that um, oops oh great because I want to make sure that there's time left over to talk about the remaining points. But if you look at slide 76. Those are the factors that will support the existence of personal goodwill, and you'll see that they're all focused on how important the shareholders' work, relationships, networking is to the value of the company. So if the shareholder were to go away, the business would be, the revenue of the business would be very significantly impacted. Um, and this often actually is the case with physician practices. Um, so it, it is something that comes up not infrequently. Um, and slide 77 is the, um, uh, are the factors that would support that Target owns a goodwill as opposed to the physician. And it's typically when there's deep management and the loss of the shareholder really wouldn't affect the um, revenues of, of the physician practice, et cetera, et cetera. Um, of course, that's just the tax considerations or non-tax considerations that go into, you know, coming up with how much value you can place on any goodwill being acquired. Um, the other thing I want to point out on slide 78 is that oftentimes, another way to break the deadlock, should you have a deadlock situation arise, is to say that the purchase price is being paid for a non-compete. And you might do this in a... Um, you might do this in a uh, stock purchase situation as well as in an asset purchase. Um, so when you sell a non-compete, when a non-compete is entered into and there's consideration allocated to the non-compete, the thing to keep in mind is that while the purchaser does get Non-competes are amortizable assets. The purchaser can get depreciation or amortization deductions with respect to the non-compete. So that's great from the purchaser side. But from the seller side, non-compete is something that gives rise to ordinary income. So to the extent purchase price is allocated to the non-compete, it's going to be ordinary income, which is going to be taxed at twice the rate. Um, these situations of double taxation come up more and more infrequently, and they only come up really where the target is relatively old, or if it's young, it's been sort of poorly advised, because these days, it's much more common for entities to be formed, physician practices to be formed, or any entities really to be formed as LLCs or S corporations. And those are both flow-through entities, which means that they don't pay an entity-level tax. They might pay it under certain circumstances, maybe like a you know, state tax fee or something, but generally they don't pay a federal income tax. So that means whether you're selling assets of these entities or you're selling stock of the entities, generally the seller's consequences are going to be the same. And those consequences are there's only one level of tax, and whether the resulting income is ordinary income or capital gain is going to turn on what sorts of assets the LLC or S corporation owns. Most of those assets, in the case of physician practices, as I said, are going to be intangibles like goodwill, um, you know, customer lists, those sorts of intangibles, and those generally should give rise to capital gain. But to the extent um, the entity owns, you know, accounts receivables or appreciated inventory, which I don't imagine there would be, or there's uh, depreciation recapture, that would all be ordinary income. So, as I said, for that reason, uh, the fact that these entities are so much more common now than a C corporation, the issue of personal goodwill and having to allocate to it come up uh, more and more infrequently. Um, 
the one quick final point I'd make, and I'm not going to go through my slides, is that I see a lot of physician practices where that are set up as S corporations because the physicians uh, have been advised that, you know, if you have an S corporation, you can basically minimize your employment taxes. If physicians are owners of an LLC and they provide services for the business of the LLC, then generally their income is subject to self-employment taxes. In contrast, if there's an S corporation and they are employed by an S corporation, their salary will be subject to self-employment or to employment taxes, but their distributions will not be. So for that reason, I see a lot of physicians setting up S corporations. The only thing I advise at that is that you have to be very careful because the IRS will, you know, this is an issue that's high on the IRS's sort of radar, um, and they will view your um, compensation arrangement to determine if it's reasonable. If you look at slide 87, there are a lot of factors set forth um, that the IRS will focus on in determining whether it's reasonable or unreasonable. And uh, second, your savings are about 3.8%, which may uh, not be as big an amount as it seems. Um, and finally, the nice thing about LLCs over S corporations is that you really can't screw up their qualification as an LLC, whereas with an S corporation, it's, you know, people sort of mishandle the election or they inadvertently have a second class of stock, which um, uh, inter can, you know, can sort of make ineffective, can terminate the S title to the corporation, and then the parties are um, in a much worse situation. So I will leave it there, and I will hand it over to Jennifer on slide 87. Okay, and I'm just going to briefly touch on this so I can leave room for Larkin at the end. Uh, there are a number of stark exceptions and anti-kickback safe harbors that arise in both asset and stock purchase deals. And some of these that we see very frequently are the isolated transactions exception under stark. There's no comparable anti-kickback safe harbor for this one, and I've listed the requirements on that slide on slide 87. Another one is the bona fide employment relationship. So frequently when a hospital is acquiring a physician practice, they will employ the physicians as part of the asset deal. The requirements for that employment relationship are listed there in order to comply with the Stark exception. The next one that's frequent is an office space lease. Another item um, that you would need to look at is to make sure that the agreement's in writing, the rental charge must be fair market value, and it can't be determined in a manner that takes into account the volume or value of referrals or using any formula based on a percentage of revenue, et cetera. Um, the space rented may not exceed that which is reasonable and necessary for the legitimate business purposes, and the agreement must be commercially reasonable even if no referrals were made. So at that, I'll turn it back over to Larkin to finish this out. Thanks, Jennifer, and uh, <clears throat> we're conscious of the time, so we'll try and uh, get this concluded here in the next few minutes. The uh, Back to the sale of assets, there, um, there, there are three traditional components to an asset sale, and that's the employment of the physicians, the, ac the acquisition of the assets, and the leasing of the real estate. And uh, what Jennifer just uh, quickly went through were three stark exceptions that related to each of these components. Um, and, and then there's common themes in, the, in each of these transactions. There's first and foremost, the valuations and appraisals. The, all of the stark exceptions, as Jennifer had listed on, the, um, on her slides, they all have something to do with the volume or value of referrals or fair market value, commercial reasonableness. And the best way of being sure that you are commercially reasonable and that the, the deal is fair market value is to have an appraisal conducted. So you have a valuation with a third party valuation company. There are you know, numbers of them across the U.S. and they come in and they value everything. They value the, the, what the positions are worth as far as compensation goes. They, they look at the bonus structure that's being proposed and they opine as to whether or not that is consistent with fair market value and, um, and, and typically will also opine, it has to be requested, as to whether or not they're commercially reasonable. Uh, they'll also do the same thing with the acquisition of the assets. They'll go through, they'll have a depreciation chart, they'll, they'll figure out exactly what, is, what, is, what the current value of the, um, of the assets are and, and, they'll, and they'll give the, uh, the, the entity or the, the two parties of the transaction, 
that will give them an idea of, of, of a range of fair market value, and then they can, they can take it from there. And uh, the reason for this is, is that the government looks at these deals. The, whether it be a whistleblower or some other context where the government gets wind that this transaction has taken place, if they come in and they look at the deal and they decide that it is and, – and they, and they want to know specifics, handing them over a, an opinion from a third-party valuation expert is going to help. It, will not, it doesn't guarantee anything. There's numbers of examples where, where it, it did not help, but it provides, it, it provides comfort and defense at time. Uh, another common theme is the, the control going forward. The, um, you know, in any physician group, the, the doctors are used to being their own bosses, and, uh, and, and they're, they're concerned as to when they sell, you know, or in theory sell their business, is what is their role going to be? So to, there's a number of arrangements you can have to where they have seats on the board of directors or the board of managers in an LLC, negative covenants where they can put their foot down and have a vote as to uh, certain actions taken by the business. And then oftentimes, they're, and the hospital would, would possibly um, agree with this, they'll have control of the day-to-day -day activities. They'll continue to run the business. You know, their office manager will, will be in control. They'll, you know, they'll sort of run the employees, and, uh, and the hospital will make the, the big decisions when, when, they, when they come. Another key component is real estate, which we'll uh, hit here in just one second. Um, looking at the um, the employment of physicians, the uh, there, there you have your typical employment agreement concepts. So non compete. What's the term? What's the termination? What what are the the reasons for termination? What, what is for cause termination, and in, in regards to no cause termination? And and typically they will have a a no cause termination provision where something's just not going right, and the, and the hospital needs to get out of the deal. Um, there's also regulatory outs where or, or outs or modifications where if there is a review and, uh, and the, the compensation is determined to not be fair market value or there's potential issues there where the, the parties will come back and restructure the deal and make sure it's compliant with the various health care laws and, and health care reg regulations. Um, and then severance, you know, that comes back to term and termination. You know, what, what was the reason for termination? Was it retirement? How long was the doctor there? The, um, and, the, and these all come up, and, and, and these are negotiated. And what, what you have to think about is that the, the doctors and the, and the hospital all want to be compliant with the law, but obviously the doctors want the most money they can get, and rightfully so. And, um, and they're going to look at the valuation as typically sometimes a negotiating tactic of the hospital when the hospital is merely trying to to be in compliance with the law, and that just has to be effectively communicated. Um, the compensation structure, and, and, and you always see the buzzwords, commercially reasonable even if no referrals were made, does not take into account the volume or values of referrals. And uh, in, in these concepts are, again, they're addressed in evaluation. Um, and so you have to look at the, you know, the base salary together with the productivity bonuses all in the front end. And, um, and, and that's, you know, that's some considerations in that aspect. Um, Office-based leases, I'll just run through this real quick. There, there are certain questions you have to ask is, first of all, what are the, what are the physician, what is the physician group's obligations with respect to their current space? Oftentimes, physician groups, or sometimes physician groups, will own their own space, and sometimes it is, it, it is a very nice, state-of-the-art facility where they have a lot of money on the line, typically financed, and uh, they've got they've got a mortgage to pay off, and so they're obviously they're they're going to want to either stay in that facility or make sure that, it, that they have a, a, a significant tenant who's going to come in there and assume their lease. Uh, what is the, what are their what are their leasing obligations if if it's not and how long are they on the hook for leasing can that be transferred to the hospital and um and and, and the physicians are just going to make sure or want to want to be sure that they are not hurt financially based on the real estate component of the deal and uh and also there's the regulatory aspect whereas the physicians are if they own the space they're going to want to get as much money as they can for that space but the hospitals can only pay so much money 
pursuant to the star call, the anti-kickback statute. And, the, uh, and they also have to have an adequate amount of space. So they can't have the space being too large, more square footage than they need, or the space being too expensive. And there's ways of, of dealing with this. If, if there, is an, there is too much space and there's, there's empty space in the building, the hospital can look at moving other groups over there or somehow consolidating the space and making use of it. But it has to be, at the end of the day, diligently thought through, and uh, the hospital has to have some level of comfort there. Okay, and the last thing is the actual acquisition of the assets. It's typically done through an asset purchase agreement. Again, it's valued on the front end. The, um, the, the valuation company comes in and, and gives you a value on the assets. Sometimes they'll be comfortable including the, the physician workforce in place, typically not goodwill. Um, then the, the hospital conducts its due diligence. It reviews the contracts. It has inspections done on the equipment. Make sure, make, you know, ensure, or gives itself comfort that the um, the business is going to operate as it did beforehand. And then there's the deal components, and, uh, and these all you know, relate to each other. So in any business transaction, you're going to have representations and warranties. You're going to have some type of indemnification that relates to those representations and warranties. Your typical or your hot button reps and warranties, the ones that you that the hospital as the acquirer is going to is going to um, require, is no violations of law, title to the assets to where they have the physician group tells the hospital they have no encumbrances as of closing. A lot of times, a portion of the uh, proceeds from the sale will go to pay off the loan um, or any type of or in, get any encumbrances removed, liens, etc. Uh, the, they'll have to rep and warrant as to the condition of the assets. And then another example is, is their employees. Have they had issues in the past? Are there, are there any type of suits that might be, that might be in the works? And um, these re representations and warranties are they, the, hot, the acquiring group is protected through indemnification. And um, <clears throat> one major concern there is after the deal, the first of all, those positions are going to be their employees and their partners in business, and uh, that's one you know, sort of political issue to take into account. And the other is that their entity is probably going to be liquidated. So there has to be some mechanism of dealing with that, and your options are having the individual physicians being named as parties and, all, and or having a holdback or some type of escrow amount where if you pay X amount of the purchase price, then a percentage of that purchase price is held back for a year, two, two years, and, you know, but, um, however, it's six months, whatever the negotiations are, to where if something comes up and they need to be indemnified, they can take that money that's being held in escrow and not have to go out and fight for it. Um, that is going to conclude our presentation. We apologize for going a little bit over and sort of hurrying there in the end, but we, we hope everybody found it useful. And, um, and again, feel free to reach out to us with any questions you may have. Um, our contact information is on the slides. Yeah, you'll, you'll receive a webinar recording and the slides in a follow-up email. And, uh, and when you exit the program, there will also be a short survey. And if you could complete that, we would appreciate it. But uh, thank you very much for attending. We th hope this is helpful. And again, feel free to reach out to us with any additional questions and follow-ups, and hope everyone has a nice day.